Okay. I believe we have the majority of our registrants on the line now. So I'm just going to kick us off with a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. My name is Amy Donahue and I am Pivot's engagement officer. And I'm super excited to welcome you to this uh, seventh edition of our virtual panel series, Voices from the Field. Uh, today's edition is a little bit special in that we're centering it around motherhood. Um, so we have a bunch of our own pivot moms on the line to discuss some of our maternal health programs and their experiences as mothers in the global health world. Um, so before I hand it over to them for discussion, I just want to note that we are recording this session. So it will be available for you to share and watch back after um, it's over. Um, and for those of you who are watching live now, I would like to suggest that you uh, change your view of the, Zoom, of the Zoom call to gallery mode so that you can see everyone's lovely smiling faces at once, but that is up to you. Um, and then one quick change for those of you who are uh, with uh, joining us for the second or third or however many times you've uh, been able to join, we're just going to, instead of using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, um, please use the chat function to message me, Amy Donahue, uh, with any questions that you would like to pose to our panelists today. Um, we just think that might help us run things a little bit more smoothly, um, and hopefully that doesn't cause too much confusion. We did get some questions in advance of today's call that we're going to try to address as many of them as we possibly can. Um, and when it is, and when we do come to your question, if we have time, we will call on you. Tara will say your name and I will enable your mic uh, capability so that we can hear directly from you um, the question that you would like to pose. It's been really nice for us to be able to connect with you in that way. Um, if you'd prefer not to, you can just ignore us and we'll carry forward and you don't have to respond. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Tara. All right, thanks, Amy. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Um, I don't know what it means that the thing that I would most like for Mother's Day is like an hour to myself. I suspect you all feel the same way sometimes. Um, so I, um, I just want to start by welcoming the, the pivot panelists today. Um, we're really excited to have this handful of women with us and so glad to see so many of you joining. Um, Mathilde, I see your husband, I see my mom, I see lots of the pivot moms in the community, a couple of women who've lived in Rana Mafana with their children, Pat Wright, the ultimate global mama. Um, anyway, it's going to be a great hour, so we're really and grateful. my mom, too. Oh, hi, mom. Oh, hi, moms. Um, <laughs> All right, so I wanna have people wave their hands so you know who's on the call. Um, we have Dr. Luva, who's gonna sort of anchor things. She is the um, senior most pivot physician right now. She's the deputy director of primary care. Luva, can you give a wave? All right, and with her in the same room in Rana Mafana is Mathilde Hutchings, and she's our director of partnerships. Robin Hernstein, our board chair at home in Long Island. And I'm Tara Lloyd, our executive director. So we're each going to speak for about five minutes about our experience um, as mothers in the field of global health and particularly about some of Pivot's maternal health programs. And I'm going to give a couple um, of headlines before we do that about just where we stand with COVID um, in terms of the um, updates from Madagascar. Um, so today's case count is at 158 um, COVID cases in Madagascar, and we um, assume that is vastly under reporting or, or under detecting because there are so few tests. Um, so we've talked about that in a couple of panels recently that we have 13 rapid tests um, at district level that at national level 200 PCR tests can be processed daily for a country of 25 million people. So we are still preparing um, for COVID to come to Afana Dean and doing all that we can to prevent that, working at a roadblock and loaning our ambulance to the national level and sitting on the council um, with the government advisors. And so it's still very much front and center for us. But as always, we are also thinking about our health systems strengthening activities in the background and making sure that women can still deliver safely and children can still get vaccines and malaria does not go untreated because those things are, of course, just as deadly in a place like rural Madagascar as COVID might be. Um, a couple of kind of fun moments or, or things just to say out loud. Um, one is that across the four women on the panel today, we have 10 children. They are all being watched elsewhere in our homes by someone, but um, we cannot guarantee they won't make appearances and that's fine. Same for your kids, of course. Um, the topic may be a bit heavier than we expected, but um, we know people are in and out um, 
my friend Jenny offered the quote that work has become home and home has become work. So there's just a sort of no difference and we are embracing that with you. Um, I also want to note that um, Mathilde is bilingual and Luva is trilingual. And so when we do these, these voices from the field and we try to connect you to our staff in Ranamathan, um, that's always a challenge. It's also evening for them. So they're, it's 7 p.m. Um, and we're just grateful to have you all on the line. So when Luva prefers not to speak in her third language, which is English, she'll just turn to Mathilde and they'll be live translating and you'll be able to hear that beautiful exchange between them. Um, so I think that's it. I'm gonna hand it over um, first to Luva to share her sort of five minutes of reflection. And as we go into this listening, I, I just wanna say that we're all parenting as global health practitioners right now, you know, no matter where you're joining us from, um, we're all in this together and we've never had more opportunity to talk to our kids about inequity in the world and, and what we can do about it than we do right now. So um, whether that's because you're an aunt or uncle or a mother, we're, we're just so grateful that you're joining us to the, for the conversation today. So Luva, over to you. Okay, okay. Uh, hello everyone. Thank you, Tara. Um, so I'm Luva and uh, I'm very happy to be with you today. Um, I finished my uh, medical study uh, at the School of Medicine uh, of the University of Antananarivo in uh, 2016. And um, immediately after that, I moved to the Ifanadin district uh, to join the pivot team as a general um, practitioner uh, at the hospital district. And uh, with my husband, uh, we, we had decided to live separately because he was already working uh, in uh, Antananarivo and uh, I wanted to work. Uh, before working with Pivot, uh, I didn't know the world of INGO and uh, humanitarian work. Uh, I just wanted to be a good clinician uh, by working with Pivot. Uh, I discovered the world of uh, humanitarian activities and um, I especially appreciate the fact that uh, we cared about other people, but uh, just only uh, about ourselves. So, I turned to the field uh, of uh, global health. In uh, 2017, uh, I was the primary care manager. Um, I lead activities and uh, a team uh, at all the health center in the district. And uh, last year, I was promoted to the deputy director uh, of uh, primary care. Uh, I was um, uh, I was um, I had my daughter. Uh, she is named Solea uh, in uh, 2018. Uh, but uh, even she was born, my husband and I was decided decided decided. decided. <laughs> To, to continue uh, to live separately because um, I, I like uh, working with Pivot so much. So uh, we continue to see uh, each other once a month or every two months. Um, it's true that uh, it's hard to work as a leader of a primary care team in a rural setting um, and uh, with a little baby, uh, but uh, it's not a sacrifice. Uh, I have to adapt my uh, motherhood to work and the work to the motherhood. Um, I have a nanny who take, takes care uh, my baby uh, when I was at uh, work and um, I prepare for my daughter's need before uh, I leave home in the morning 
and uh, at uh, lunch break and when i come home from work um also uh, having my 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 daughter uh, ha was help me uh, to understand more about the mother we serve in the community uh, because for example uh, before i had my daughter i took care of uh, an uh, accurately malnourished child and i noticed from the mother breast that uh, she didn't have enough milk so i advanced her to drink a lot of water uh, to get more more milk uh, she said that uh, she uh, already drink uh, more uh, water but uh, she didn't have enough milk so i I didn't believe her and uh, I insist to I insist with her that uh, she should drink so when I have Solea uh, I had the same problem uh, so I remember her uh, and uh, that made me understand that uh, she wasn't lying uh, so um, mother would what ha has helped me more uh, to put myself in the place of the mother we serve and uh, made me even more rigorous uh, in finding solution for them. So that's uh, about me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Buba. That's a really lovely um, way to share your experience and I'm sure people will have questions for you. Um, Thank you very much for saying that. I think I'm next. Am I next? Yes. Okay. Um, so for me, motherhood and global health are really deeply intertwined. Um, I actually showed up to my first paid job with Partners in Health in Malawi pregnant. And it was sort of the pinnacle of my career. I had worked to that point as a volunteer in Lesotho in Malawi. Um, for five years and lived in rural Alaska. And I'm from Kentucky. I, I'd had a lot of exposure to health disparities and had decided to get a master's degree um, at Hopkins to take all that volunteer experience and really try to get um, a, a hold on a career for good in this work. And when I think back to showing up pregnant, it's so funny because um, I didn't know I was pregnant and I thought, wow, I'm really reacting negatively to like the onions people put in the breakfast in Malawi. Like I just, and the smell of coffee, like something is just up with me, but I don't know what it is. And the woman who I was replacing, who was there um, in Nano having handover with me, it was like, you know, you're pregnant. And I said, oh, no, 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 I have endometriosis. I was told as a child that I can't get pregnant. It's like very unlikely that I'm pregnant. I'm sure it's something else. And then as I started like throwing up and, you know, it all began, I was like, wow, I'm pregnant. And I went to my boss, whose name is Jonas. Jonas, if you're out there, I love you, but I do remember something funny about you, which is that I told him I was pregnant and he put his head in his hands and said, oh my God, this is very bad news. Um, and I said, I don't think it has to be very bad news. I think we can figure this out. Um, and what he thought was, you're going to quit um, because you're in rural Malawi where it is less likely that women survive childbirth and can raise healthy children. And, you know, why would you stay here when you could just go home? Um, and I thought, I've never needed to be here more. I'm going to figure this out. Um, and so my husband and I began sort of the journey of figuring it out. And now it feels completely inextricable to me, the sort of motherhood experience and the leading a global health organization experience, because I think it is so important for the reasons that Luba just described that people who can so naturally empathize with those we're serving are in roles like this and that it doesn't have to be this dichotomy where eventually you have to quit because it gets too hard. Um, and there's all kinds of people that make that possible for me. My mom, who takes care of my kids when I'm traveling. Robin, who as our board chair, every time I've proposed some new scenario to how I'm going to manage kids and pivot says yes. Um, and right now what it looks like is that I take the children with me um, and we live in Rana Mafana during the summer and live in Kentucky during the school year. And that's been a really nice way to handle it because 
what it allows is for them to be completely intertwined in the work and totally understand what it means. What is it that my job is and what is it that Pivot is doing in the world? Um, and Rana Mafana is beautiful. We live in the rural rainforest in this communal guest house where every year we go back to the same spot. The kids have their neighbors and their friends and their favorite babysitters and they can play with Solea, Luva's daughter and Mathilde's kids. And it's a really beautiful part of our life. I don't think of it as a sacrifice, um, but it is true that my kids have had malaria and that I take risks that I have to think about really carefully by making these choices. My husband would say the risk of death by video games in America is worse, but you know, I mean, every time I do it, I kind of have a moment of being like, I don't know, am I going to go again this year? And then as soon as we get there, it's just, we just blend into the rhythm of life and it feels like this is such an incredible way for them to have a perspective on their own privilege that I hope shapes who they are. Um, and when I have really particularly hard moments where I feel like the burden of being the executive director of an organization facing some of the world's most intractable problems um, on the other side of the world. It's just too much. And I feel like, oh my gosh, I go to preschool pickup and someone asks me how my day was and I start talking about plague and I'm just like not relatable. Maybe I should just like wrap it up and get a normal job or stay home with my children for a while. And I recently asked my eight-year-old son, Zeke, that question. He spent the first two years of his life in Malawi to go back to Jonas's worry. I didn't quit. We made it work. We brought him back as an infant and he stayed until he was two and those were really happy years in our life. Um, but when I ask Zeke now, what does he think? Does he wish that I would pick him up from school um, and just be less burdened as a parent or I don't know, more able to come to every soccer game? He actually said to me, well, your work is not done. You know, I mean, there there are still a lot of children in need in Rana Mafan and, and you know, you're a long way from having solved this problem. And those aren't his exact words, but he just kind of the look on his face of like, do I think you should not do this? Like, absolutely not. And I, I think it's just like become such a part of your identity that that's where I draw my strength. Um, and then what we're trying to do with Pivot is just every time we're at a moment where we could decide to lean in and support someone who's trying to parent through global health choices and careers, we say yes, and we figure out what that means. Because there are a lot of people who went before us who came to the moment of making that decision and there just wasn't the structure there. The, maybe the organization didn't provide health insurance or didn't pay for a plane ticket home at Christmas for the child or, you know, in Luva's case, the sacrifice was too great to live 11 hours away from your husband and have to get home or I guess have him come to you by public transportation once a month. Um, there are interesting challenges to solve for our professional Malagasy staff as well as our, our international staff in that like the education system in Rana Mafana is, is you know, different than if you lived in the city. And so our, we're trying to strengthen one of the local schools to help people be able to stay once their kids get school age and every thing like that that comes our way, we sort of step back and because Robin and I can both sort of be mothers first, we say, okay, how do we make this possible so that women who are, are in these leadership roles can make this work because we believe we'll save more lives and that the empathy that we, we all um, come to this from is part of it. So um, I'll talk more about that if people have questions later, but um, I do think about it often in terms of the course that we're trying to chart as an organization. Mathilde, you are up next. I thought Mathilde's last. I'm I thought I was kidding. last. Mathilde is last. I'm trying to look <laughs> at my notes, but I hid them. Okay. <laughs> Robin, you're next. Yes. Well, I wanted that, that actually just made me, you know, I, I want to um, add on to one thing you said there, Tara, which really um, I think is a really important part of Pivot. We are focusing today on mothers and motherhood and supporting moms, but there are a lot of dads with Pivot who are making big sacrifices too. And um, our whole board, you know, everybody, it is about putting, um, professionally, we like to put the family first and we feel like, you know, people have to be able to live their life um, in a way that's rewarding and productive for them. And it is complicated and there are different, um, different uh, solutions for different families, but that's a great, you know, it is a real part of the organization that I think everyone on the board is really proud of. Um, that we're able to do that. There's lots of young kids um, 
with, with the dads too. And it's a lot, there are a lot of young pivot kids. We had a whole camp the last time we went there uh, for pivot kids. So, um, so my story uh, that I just wanted to share one really short story, which was um, kind of my experience and um, in, in, in being in Madagascar and, and finding using uh, my motherhood, my uh, connection with my children to, to connect with the people in the villages. So this was very early on when my oldest, um, who turns 14 on Friday, was probably, uh, he must have been about five at the time, and um, my girls were three. So I was over on a visit, and we would go to these villages, and as Tara mentioned, uh, it's a trilingual, actually over there, it's pretty much bilingual, French and um, Malagasy, and when you get out into the villages, the remote villages, it's almost entirely Malagasy. So I would be listening to an elder or talking to um, the community health care worker or meeting a school and someone would always be translating for me in Malagasy, which is a language that like just doesn't, it, it's, it's just very difficult language uh, to learn. And, um, and so I would, I would be sitting there and, and I, you know, you can watch people's faces as you're being introduced or as they're talking about you and things and they would keep coming. Um, in a couple of different villages, I would notice that there was one word where everyone would, would perk up, and, and particularly the mothers, and it would get this kind of ooh and ah out of the crowd, and they would say kombinatelu, which means um, triplets in uh, Malagasy. And um, I have triplets, and so every time I would, they would say, she has five children, and her girls are, are triplets, um, there was this connection, this um, kind of like they would say, wow, that's awesome. You're very strong. That's very hard. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, um, maybe, but I have so much support and I hope you all have, you know, the same support um, to have healthy deliveries and to have all, you know, what I had. And I think back, um, well, actually, we were just talking that five months ago, there was a set of, of identical triplets born at the CHRD. Um, and identical triplets are, are pretty rare. That's what mine are as well. They were born um, at the CHRD in uh, Ifanadine, and they, um, you know, I can compare that mother's experience to mine and just my respect for what the, the, they pull off over there is so amazing. I mean, we've, uh, she didn't know she was having triplets until she got to the hospital. Um, but now at least there was a hospital and we were able to support her birth. But I think, you know, of, I thought it was hard being pregnant and scary being pregnant and difficult. Um, you know, the delivery was scary, but I had 16 people in an operating room with me when I gave birth to my girls. You know, a team for each baby, a team for me. It was very controlled. Everything was going to be fine. I, they were all head down 36 and a half weeks and, you know, you, we could have tried for a natural delivery, but everyone's like, no, 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 it's just, it's just too dangerous. Everything needs to, everyone needs to be safe, which we agreed with. And so that was, you know, what we did. So um, I look at the, the mothers over there and I say, you know, how would my life have been different? Uh, what are they having to do on their own? Are they able to get their hands on formula to feed three babies at once, which is incredibly difficult. Probably not. So are they helping in the community? You know, just, it, it just affects your view of, I, I think, how you look, look at everything. So um, the, the little identical triplets are all healthy too. They're five months old now. They're adorable. So, but that's just a story of kind of the connection. It, it helps me um, look at the work in, in, you know, in a different way and connect with the people because they see, oh, you're a, um, here's this woman, she's from America you know, who is she? What is she? You know, but then the second they find out you're a mother or a father, you know, and they, they, the, those connections of family are a really great way to bond with um, the people we serve because that is such a shared experience, even if we are experiencing it in very different settings. Those feelings you have towards your child are, are universal and a real connection. So those are my thoughts. Thank you, Robin. Mathilde? Want to close us out with opening remarks? Sure. Thank you. Um, thanks, Tara. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Robin, you've just made me emotional right before talking. That's not a great idea. <laughs> the feelings about being a mother. 
Um, yeah, so I, uh, so my name is Mathilde Hutchings. I recently joined Pivot as Director of Partnerships and moved to Rana Mafana about six months ago with my family, um, my husband Matthew and our two girls, uh, who are hopefully watching quietly at home, uh, Eleanor who's uh, four and Annabelle who's almost two. Um, and for us, the decision to move here with young children was obviously not a light one, but, um, but it was actually pretty easy. Uh, everything kept pulling me to saying yes to this job. Uh, from the fact that my taking two and a half years off uh, from paid work to raise my children was uh, counted as experience um, for this job, to, um, uh, to the strong support from Tara, as she mentioned, for mothers being public health leaders. Uh, and, and then one of the biggest parts of the decision was for my girls to get the experience to live here and learn and live a different way of life um, and to see me follow my passion. I think that was something that was really important to me. I wanted them to, to know that uh, their mom did um, everything she could to follow uh, her dreams. Um, so there definitely are things that are scary about uh, raising my children here in a, in a developing country, like there are more frequent road accidents. So we're very careful um, to have them in their car seats buckled up every single time we get in the car and we just try not to get in the car too much. Um, and we're very careful when, they're, when we're walking along the main road um, or infectious diseases that they've never been exposed to. But, um, but the benefits of living here and taking this job far outweighed the, the risks for us. So it was, um, it was, an, it was an easy decision. And then uh, as, as everyone has been saying, the opportunity for me to personally witness um, the lives of the people that we help here, especially the mothers, um, just means that I, I can do my work in a much deeper way. I can understand what people are going through. And then when I'm trying to make partnerships with new organizations or trying to ask, uh, you know, write grant proposals um, to fund our work. Uh, it's, it's, I understand it on a much more personal level having lived here. Um, of course, now with COVID, the risks uh, of living here with young children are even higher. And um, we were offered the opportunity to evacuate once, uh, once the COVID pandemic started. Um, but my husband and I were very firm in our desire to stay uh, and to help this community in a time of even greater need than usual. Um, and what I, what I said to Tara and other leadership um, was exactly what Zeke said, my work here is not done. I, um, I haven't finished what I came to achieve. So, um, so we said, thanks, but no thanks, we'll stay for a bit longer. Um, and then the last thing I'll say uh, about what really drew me to Pivot was uh, its very strong focus on maternal and child health programs, um, which is what my master's focused on, my master's in public health. Um, uh, I've been following Pivot's work for a long time since since the beginning, really. But it was a picture that um, that Tara sent in sort of you know a broadcast email of of her uh, with Zoe on her back um, going to visit some distant health center to talk about increasing in facility um, deliveries that really clinched it for me. Um, I was kind of hooked. So uh, now it's really exciting that I get to strap my baby on my back and um, and carry on the uh, the important work that we do here. Um, and I think Luva will tell us a little bit about the maternal uh, health programs in just a little bit. Thank you all so much. Um, okay, um, so it's 1230. Um, I can take this a couple of different directions, but I think the first thing I'd like to do is go back to Luva for more explanation of the maternal health programs so that then we can see if people want to spend the conversation there or more on the personal side of things. And I want to say one more time um, that the sort of moment of empathy that COVID is creating, where all of a sudden we're all parenting through a global health pandemic, feels very real to me. So um, if you are joining um, from Long Island or a place in the US that's been really hard hit, um, I just want you to know that um, we really deeply count you in this circle. And I hope we can talk a little bit about what some of that has felt like. and. Um, it might not be unusual for, you know, Mathilde and me in quite the same way, and yet it totally is different because this, this is different. So um, I, I think it'd be nice to spend a little bit of time there. Um, Luva, will you give the highlights of Pivot's maternal health programs and we'll see if people have questions, please. Okay. 
thank you, Tara. So for the maternal health program overall, uh, we support uh, continuous capacity building of uh, clinical staff and uh, community health workers on the time of, uh, mater uh, of uh, maternal and uh, reproductive health, uh, equipment at the health centers, uh, setting up a watching home for the pregnant woman uh, in the health center uh, and uh, in a collaboration with the community, uh, donation of a mother and a child kit for women who give birth at the health center and the donation of a food staff uh, kit uh, for the pregnant women and uh, their attendants uh, who are waiting uh, to give birth uh, at the pregnant women's uh, waiting home. Uh, reinforcement of uh, sensitization in the community by the community health worker and uh, in a health center by the clinical staff. At the community level, we also support uh, home visit and uh, targeted outreach uh, with a proactive uh, approach in the collaboration with uh, community health workers. Uh, currently in Ranmafana, but uh, it will expand with a proactive community approach. Um, implementation of mobile uh, prenatal visit by the community health supervisor uh, who are our uh, community team monthly in uh, communities more than 10 kilometers from a uh, health center uh, reinforcement of uh, community family planning uh, pregnancy testing testing uh, by the community health workers and uh, referral to health centers for the early uh, prenatal visit, uh, searching for patient lost to follow up in uh, prenatal visit and uh, family uh, planning in the community uh, by the community health uh, worker and uh, finally uh, motivation of matrons uh, to bring pregnant women to the health center um, that's all. thank you Lava. thank you thank you that's great. Um, I, you know, one thing I would say to the audience is a lot of the work that Luva described um, for women to fully participate um, in prenatal antenatal care to deliver in the facilities requires making a decision about how to manage the rest of your children who are back in your community and how to have the responsibilities of tending for the farm or the fields um, way in the decision about whether you should come early to the health facility and wait in the waiting homes we build so that if you have a high risk pregnancy, you'll be there and be supported during delivery so that you don't have to walk while you're in labor um, to the health center to receive care. Um, but, but how do you make that decision when you have children that um, still need to be fed and cared for while you're away and you don't know how long you'll be gone? And um, so really Luva um, in her role, does a lot to build faith in, in the relationships directly as a mother herself to encourage women to, to use the facilities and to have safe deliveries and enroll their children in the health system upon birth and with vaccines and everything that that means. So um, I, we're, we're just grateful for um, every life that Luva has saved. I'm sure there are many. Um, okay, so I'm gonna turn us to questions now. Um, I've actually asked um, Dr. Alicia Mayfield, our chief medical officer, to hop on the line because we got a really clinical question about pregnancy and COVID. And I thought it would be nice to have um, Alicia answer it directly. So we were giving Alicia the day off, but well, not the whole day, just the session. Um, she's been on many others, as you all have, have seen. Um, Ivana, I don't know if we still have you on the line. Um, Amy, can you see if Ivana is still there? She's got the question and I wanted to unmute.
mute her mic if we could. I don't believe so. <clears throat> but Ivana, if you are, um, go ahead and raise your hand. But I, I don't see her on the list now. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll give just a moment in case she happens to be that telephone number we can see. Um, but otherwise, we'll go ahead and ask the question because I think people have wondered and um, Alicia is ready to answer. So the, the question is, um, is there research being done to understand the particular impact of COVID-19 infection during pregnancy and postpartum period? Yeah, hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So this is a really good question. Um, that comes up regularly and we are just starting to have data. <clears throat> We're just starting to have data on this. So um, they, there are studies going on. Um, what we have today is pretty preliminary. Um, so far, it doesn't seem like there is any significant uh, difference in the impact of COVID-19 on pregnant women as opposed to the general population, but it's really too soon to say for sure. Um, because all of this data is relatively new and it's kind of still coming in. And as I'm sure you've seen, uh, information and what we know about COVID-19 is really changing not only on a weekly basis, but almost on a daily basis. Um, there are differences in the immune systems of pregnant women and the way that they function um, that do uh, impact their response to infections in general and, and certainly to certain other viral infections. So there have been concerns that pregnant women might be more at risk for uh, the effects of COVID-19, but so far to date, we haven't seen any evidence of that, which is certainly encouraging. And then the other thing that we know so far is that we have not seen um, mother, to mother to child transmission. So it doesn't seem to date like COVID-19 crosses the placenta, which is also really encouraging, um, but again, kind of early on. Um, and then as far as the postpartum period, uh, we have seen a small number of neonatal infections that were thought to have come from maternal transmission during routine infant care. So relatively recently, uh, the Centers for Disease Control here in the United States did change their recommendations and suggest that mothers who are infected with COVID-19 should be separated from their newborns during the period where they're thought to be particularly infectious. Um, so those are the main things that we know right now. And then uh, for Dr. Luva and others, what we're thinking about is how do we maintain the important routine services like antenatal care, um, well baby visits and maternal deliveries in facilities. How do we maintain those services uh, while keeping them safe and protected from getting infected with COVID when they come to a healthcare facility? And maybe I'll just mention one other thing uh, on what Luva said, because I really wanted to highlight uh, what she mentioned about mobile antenatal care. Um, I don't know if people noticed it because it was quick. And even if you did, you probably wouldn't realize quite what is involved with that because my prior experience with mobile antenatal care has been you get in a Range Rover or some sort of truck or bus and you go out to a community the community comes and you provide antenatal services and then go back to a facility. Because we're dealing with really remote communities, these are nurses and midwives that are going out for weeks at a time, trekking um, across rivers, over mountains, by foot, carrying all their supplies with them and providing antenatal services really deep in rural communities. Um, and it's a really tough job. So I just wanted to highlight uh, how great it is that that's been expanding our antenatal care for mothers. Thank you, Alicia. We appreciate the guest appearance. <laughs> um, all right, for our next question, I think I'll go to Murdy. Murdy, if you're on the line, you've asked three different and all lovely questions. I think I'll let you decide which one of them feels most relevant right now. Marty is spending COVID in a national forest as a graduate student working from there. So her internet connection might be a little shaky. Are you there, Marty? I am, yes. Can you all hear me? Yes. Um, uh, I'm, uh, so my, one of my questions was, what are the biggest challenges, I think, um, 
for you all since you've, you know, become mothers and working in this field. Surely it's not all, you know, positive. If you care to share what, um, I think you've all touched on um, many of those already, so. The biggest challenge is in balancing the sort of the work and life and children in the mix. Um, okay, so I think um, any one of us could answer that. Um, does anybody, usually I assign, I say, ooh, this question will be for whomever. Who feels I'll, ready? I'll say one thing. I, I'm the least qualified because my kids have visited but not um, actually lived there for a long period of time. But we were actually sharing uh, photos before this event and um, maybe maybe at some point we'll be able to put together a, a slideshow to show everyone. But we were passing around the happy photos that you guys saw in the invitation of us with our families or our kids. And then came the second round of photos and there's a photo of my kids um, uh, sitting at a, a restaurant in town after the 11 and a half hour drive and the endless days and, and and like four of them are asleep on the table with their Coca-Colas, which they're so excited about because they don't get them in America. And one's like holding it together barely. And, you know, it is hard. It, it's, it's hard and, and it's tiring and you have to juggle a lot. Um, but it is rewarding too. It, it changes how they look at the world so much. But these other women have done it more deeply than I have. But those are funny pictures and they do exist. We're definitely going to run the B-roll for everybody to... <laughs> See the other side, the hard days. I think um, what I would say, uh, uh, the, one of the biggest challenges for me since moving here um, with my children has been uh, finding my new village. Everyone talks about how it takes a village to raise a family. And I had uh, established a really great village in Boston and I had some really great friends who, um, who were in the same stage of life as me, had children in the same age. And I really miss them. I miss being able to, um, exchange with them ideas about, oh my God, I'm potty training a second child. How do I do this? Which by the way, I am in the middle of potty training a second child. So send your tips my way. Um, but uh, but we have a different village here. We The people here, the Malagasy people are so welcoming and so wonderful. And um, we we go, well, we went to restaurants before restaurants were closed. We They're kind of starting to open again, which is lovely. We go to restaurants and my husband and I can have a nice meal, even though we have our children with us because the the staff just want to play with our children. And um, actually how we found our nanny, well, how our nanny came to be a, a childcare provider was that um, the people who, the expats who lived in the house that I'm living in, maybe five people ago, we're doing the same thing at a restaurant. They're online. And, yeah. Stefan Israel. Yeah, Stefan Israel. Are they here? Are they online? Yeah, they were at a restaurant and um, and Madame Rivo was one of the servers and she just played so well with their little girls while they were having their meal. And they just said, hey, do you want to take care of our children? And she has been taking care of Pivot children ever since. And she's, um, she's our lovely nanny now and we adore her and we couldn't do this. I couldn't do this work without knowing that she they were safe with her. So we found we found a different village and you just um, adjust and build a new one uh, with every new place you go. And I'm, to be honest, I'm used to moving around. I moved a lot when I was little. So the, uh, the change is not that hard for me, but. <laughs> I have two thoughts. One is um, that for me, when my children were little, I really wanted to nurse. And I, I was trying to figure out how to make that work with, um, you know, just going to an office. And it was so easy in Malawi because it just was so normal. Like I, um, I would bring my baby um, in over the nurse hour to lunch or, or I'm sorry, in over the lunch hour to nurse or um, Miriam who took care of him would sometimes bring him by if he was hungry in the middle of the day. And, um, and I had this nursing cape that I would wear and the um, staff in Malawi thought it was so funny because he was hot. And so he would cry and they were like, we just don't, we don't really know why you do that to him. Um, why don't you just nurse the baby? And I would be like leading a meeting. I remember negotiating our cell phone contract for our 200 person staff and the 400 people at the hospital who were supported by this network coverage. And I was trying to be all hardcore, like we're not going to take any business from Airtel, blah, blah. And I was nursing. And I was like, I can't, I, I actually can't do both these things, like drive home my business point and keep the baby comfortable. But because the men in the room, the Malawian men were so comfortable with it, it just like dissolved as a problem and we like carried on and when we were done, I handed 
Zeke to Miriam and went on with my business. And um, I completely lost that when I came back to the US. I mean, you know, nobody holds your baby at a restaurant, as you just said, Mathilde, because like all the servers, all the like 14 year old men who are busboys want to help you. That's just not <laughs> our norm. Nobody scoots over in line for you. Um, and so I had a real sort of transition back here to figuring out like, wow, why do we make it so hard? You know, is this necessary? Um, and I, I think about that a, a lot, just in terms of, of the norms and the cultures and the way we set people up to succeed um, or not. So that's one side for me. And then the other side is just that um, I really owe it to the Pivot staff, my Pivot core staff, who support having a mother as a leader. It, it takes a lot from those um, folks who don't have kids because there's no way I pull my weight at, on the weekend or late nights or, you know, I mean, there just are times that like, I have to be excused, especially right now during COVID, you know, I work an eight hour stretch and then my kids are like desperate for attention right outside the door. And if I don't take a break and give it to them, um, we all sort of suffer. And then I come back once my husband is home from work and carry on again, but um, it requires a lot from the rest of the team. And my kids feel really connected to the rest of the team. And they think of themselves as sort of part of this big pivot family. But um, I remember being on the other side of that, being young and working for a nonprofit. Um, I, I worked for a woman who had twins and she was a lawyer and she worked, I think two days a week and I worked five and we ran this conservation organization. And I recently reached out to her and said, I just wanna say Margaret that I, you were amazing. I don't know how you were leading that organization with twins. I'm sorry that I kept telling you that like the vomit on your sleeve was gross. And I was sort of grumpy about like coming early and staying late and it's all on me and she doesn't pull her weight. And now I kind of feel like, oh, I get it. And we're just sort of in this like cycle of life. <laughs> it will be someone else's turn next. And, you know, in another decade, I'll pull my weight again. Um, and in the meantime, it feels like what we bring to the conversation is this sort of different lens. And I, I hope there's space for everybody um, sort of in terms of the professional journey. Um, and I think um, Luva wanted to add a little something to Julia. Oh, right. Okay, okay uh, I will say in French, c'est que she pas de temps libre mm -hmm. parce que uh, je, co je compense le temps de travail avec mon enfant donc mm -hmm. je, quand je, je suis à la maison je, je prends plus de mm -hmm. soin d'elle mm -hmm. ouais. so what Luva is saying is that she finds that she doesn't have free time for herself which I think all mothers can relate to because um, she works so hard at work and she tries to compensate for that extra time at work by spending extra time with her daughter um, when she gets home. And so when she's home, it's just, it, it's more, more time that she's not um, spending on herself. Okay. Um, so I think I'll, I'll take another question now. Um, and I, there are a couple of people on the line who I just want to acknowledge are in this with us um, as well. Um, a friend of mine, Ash Rogers, who runs an organization in Kenya, um, called Lawala has joined us today. Um, and I think she could actually answer this question and any of us could, but I'm gonna ask if I can unmute you, Nancy Palace, to ask your um, particular question. Oh, I'm sorry, wait. Nancy and Janet's question just got completed. I might ask yours in a second, Nancy, but it's Janet Powell whose question I think Ash is well positioned to, to join us in answering. Janet, are you still there? Oh, shoot. I'm sorry. I keep calling on people who are gone. Oh, no, no, she's here. She's here, but she needs Janet's to unmute herself. Oh, I, just, Janet. I just enabled your mic, Janet, if you'd like to ask your question. Hello. Hi, Janet. <laughs> Thank you so Janet. much for doing this. And Matilda, it's so great to see you and hear about your oh, work. Oh, you too. Thanks, Wonderful. Janet. Janet's in the choir with me at Trinity. The, the, now the virtual choir. <laughs> My question, I think you've really all touched upon it um, in various ways, but I was just curious. I don't know. I did not know the impact of COVID on Madagascar. I had no idea. And you, as you may know, in the Boston area, we, we are all housebound and no choir. Everything's virtual. If you go out, you have to wear masks. There's no two people sitting together like Matilda's. Um, we just, we're very isolated. But so I, I, not knowing your situation, I was curious how you feel it is 
if at all, uh, the health and well-being of you, your families, and the, the, the people that you serve. What impact do you see now, and are you concerned about increasing impact as time goes on? Thank you, Janet. Um, okay, so Ash, we're going to unmute you because I think um, having you introduce yourself and, and share sort of your first impressions of that question would be lovely. And then um, any of the rest of the Pivot folks, if it feels clear to you, please join. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And tell us how um, you have and all that fun stuff, Ash. Who are your sure. right now? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, um, uh, my name is Ash Rogers, and I'm the executive director of the Walla Community Alliance, and we are um, uh, an aligned uh, uh, community health organization uh, with with Pivot. We work in in Western Kenya, and um, I am a mother of two. I have a four and a half year old and a one year old, um, and actually gave birth to my first child um, in Nairobi. Uh, moments after, not really moments, maybe hours after receiving the job offer for for this job at, at Lawala, um, and so similar to to Tara, my my um, career as a as a, a leader in, in global health um, really aligns with with becoming a mother, and are are really connected and, and aligned for me. Um, to your to your question on. Uh, what we're seeing is the impacts in our community in, in Kenya, um, our case counts in the hundreds and we in our county, we've just had the first two cases confirmed this week. So really early days. Um, but Kenya, like a lot of sub-Saharan African countries, um, were much faster, I think, particularly than the U.S. to have lockdown orders. And we've had pretty... Uh, uh, stringent restrictions on movement um, for for almost the same timeline that we've had. I live I live in, in Nashville, Tennessee now. So we've had similar restrictions in Kenya, the uh, same timeline as we've had in Nashville. And, you know, one big impact that we're seeing on that, the first is just the economic impact on these households. Um, and uh, it's one thing to ask all of us to stay home um, and to stock food in bulk and so forth. But for the rural poor who already have really high food insecurity, who really rely on being able to go to the market and trade, um, asking them to stay home is a decision often between, um, between the, the threat of hunger and the threat of malnutrition and the threat of this virus. And that's just a really disproportionate burden that the whole world is putting on the poor um, by by our social distancing measures and um, and and I think that it's really important for folks like us to to realize that and, and also see that as um, as a public health concern and something that we can address through public health. Um, and then the other the other effects that we're seeing right now of COVID, I'm really aligned with with some of the comments that that Pivot has made is around just the continuity of care. Um, and making sure that folks still have access to primary health services um, and finding new ways to deliver those primary health services that are still safe, um, both keeping our health workers safe, but also keep community members safe so that they can continue to access contraceptives and they can continue to access prenatal care. Um, they can continue to, to deliver um, with a skilled attendant at, at a health facility um, and making sure that all of those things are, are in place and that there's good operations around them to, to make that possible. Thank you, Ash. Um, I particularly wanted Jill to have a moment to, to hear from Ash because it's um, a huge part, part of my support network is just not being alone. Um, and so sometimes Ash and I have little dialogues in the background of a giant conference call that's like, oh my God, are your children going crazy? Mine are nursing it. <laughs> and like, I'm trying to, you know, make sense of this and really like find my thread and lead and, um, and I think there's solidarity um, across those of us that have chosen this foot in both worlds life. Um, but as I said about COVID earlier, now there's just a foot in all worlds. We're all in this together. So that feels really real. Um, thank you, Ash. Um, Thanks. All right, so we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, I do um, have one more question I wanna take, but Robin, I wondered from the Long Island perspective, if you'd like to answer about the effect of the pandemic, um, just on the sort of well-being of your family and the way you think about things. Well, that's, um, yeah, so, so we've been on lockdown now for, I guess, eight weeks. 
um, lots of people on the line, I'm sure, in the same situation. I think what Ash said, though, is, is really interesting because the perspective of being able to stay on lockdown and you can order the things you need off Amazon and you can get, uh, you know, delivery from a restaurant or you can get your groceries delivered and you, um, you know, we're in the position to say that, to, to be able to do that. Not everyone in America is. There are people definitely uh, with significant economic impacts as well, who this is really uh, stressing. But that idea of, of um, trying to do all the things I'm doing with homeschooling and, and you know, balancing that with work and everything is, is even um, harder if you are in a situation where, you know, what is social distancing going to look like in Madagascar, um, where, you know, everybody lives in such close quarters and, and you don't have a refrigerator or a, a pantry or anything to keep extra supplies on hand and you may not have the ability to go buy things even if, if you had space. So there's just, it makes it just one level more complicated. And so I think um, trying to be aware of, you know, how we will modify our approaches as we get COVID cases to say, you know, okay, if a mother gets COVID, then how does that affect how we handle her, her family, her relations and the contact tracing and things like that um, will be, will be really interesting. Thank you, Robin. Um, all right, I have two points of reflection for closing. One is going to be to call on Luva to share a proverb with us, a Mother's Day tribute. But before that, I'm saying that so you can get ready, Luva. Um, I have asked a very special mother in the Pivot community to share her reflections on raising a daughter that has gone off to save the world. Um, Laura Corday is our country director, and she started with us. 24 years old, took a two year position with us um, to help found Pivot in 2014. She's in year seven um, in Rana Mafana. She's our country director now. She's married a Malagasy man who's our chef and um, her mother Catherine uh, visits from time to time and of course has a daughter who has long ago gone off to fight the world's ills and means that she's very far from her. So I thought it would be nice just to, to turn on your mic, Catherine. Thank you. For the sacrifice and, and also see if you have anything to share about about raising strong women in this world. Can you hear me? I'm not sure if my yes. yes you can. Hi everybody. Thank you to you guys. So let me just say I have a few I noted down a few things to say. So um, <clears throat> I'm a loving mother obviously and a very proud mother of two amazing girls. I have Natalie who lives in Barcelona and Laura and Renoma Fun. Uh, and both of them, strangely or not, followed my footsteps in living, working, and marrying into another culture. So you can go figure that. Remember, I'm from a small town in northeastern Ohio um, called Hudson, and I now live in Garche, France. So I guess we're global, but you know, uh, it was always a bit surprising that it ended up this way. So I'm kind of a newbie to global health compared to all of you amazing mothers here today, but with Laura, living and breathing uh, all of this. I apologize if I get emotional, sorry about this. <laughs> um, with uh, Laura living and breathing and Renoma Farm with Pivot over the past six years, I've learned so much and embraced the importance and the commitment and the difference that you are all making there. And now with Laura leading the way, I couldn't be more impressed or prouder to see how she's helping move more things forward as best she can. And we do the best that we can to support her. So thank goodness for you know, WhatsApp, videos, you know, telephones, everything to keep us closer and especially even more these days. So I'll get through this here, I'm almost done. I've been to Madagascar three times um, and each time I get to Renoma Fun, I'm just like a rock star because I'm Laura's mom. You know, everybody knows me, I'm welcomed, I, people stop me on the street, it just, and I've met Luva, I've met so many people that it's just wonderful. I've met you, Tara, I don't know if you remember, we were on, both of us driving different directions on RN7 and we stopped alongside of the road and had a photo opportunity and hugged and went on our way. And then I think a Zebu jumped on your car and you know, you had it, there you know, it was just all sorts of interesting things happen in Madagascar. But what I wanted to say just to close that on my last trip, which was Laura and Adza's beautiful wedding last, last August, um, I said it then and I'll say it again now that 
Laura rocks, right? She's, uh, she's quite the rock star. And um, I just want to thank you all for, and everyone in Pivot, you Tara in particular, for believing in her and supporting her as much as you do. So it means everything. So thank you. Thank you. Catherine, that was so beautiful. I, uh, oh, I always think so nice. that, oh, I have a guest. You're to make us cry. Oh, hi, oh Deke. yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Deke's here to say it's over, it's over. He's got his Madagascar shirt on. I have a oh, stick on so my door that says don't come in until one o'clock, but it's 102. Okay, so I want to have Lua close us out. Um, Catherine, that was incredible and beautiful. And yes, we believe in Laura. We absolutely every day believe in Laura and are where we are because of her. So Luba, if you will do a quick Mother's Day closing and offer us your Malagasy proverb and tell us what it means, we really appreciate it. Je suis dire malgache et puis après la, la traduction littérale okay. et puis après ce que ça veut dire. Ok. Uh, so, um, for proverb breeze in Malagasy, neni kitap ni funusana. Uh, literally, mom, uh, who is my container and uh, I am well covered in it. So, mommy, uh, mommy who is my container and I'm well covered in it. But she'll explain what it actually yeah. means. <laughs> okay, so um, this refers to the mother who carried her children uh, for nine months uh, in her belly, where the babies uh, felt good, uh, mother and child were inseparable, uh, so it's natural for mothers uh, to worry about their child's future. What a beautiful way to end. Thank you, Lula. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Please join us Happy next Mother's week. Day. We will Thank have um, you. probably a science focus. We're still figuring it out, um, and we'll let you know as soon as we do. But we're really grateful for this lovely connection and for all of you. Happy Mother's Day. Bye. Bye.